Hey guys, Kathy Rankin here with BrickHouse.tv on your all-access pass. And I am here with Jeff Tate, one of the premier vocalists in rock and roll and heavy metal and my favorite. So, Jeff, I want to talk to you. You're supporting the 30-year anniversary of Operation Mind Crime. And we were talking already a little bit about the album and the themes. I got to tell you, when I was 18, I remember hearing the album for the first time. And I was at a party that I probably shouldn't have been at. And somebody put that album on, and the whole place went nuts. And all I remember is that opening riff to Revolution Calling, and I just had chills. Mm. Everything else in the room, it seems like, disappeared. And I know, obviously, I'm not the only one who has that feeling when they listen to that album. And you don't listen to one song. You have to listen to the whole thing front to back. So when you guys were making the album, did you – was that the goal? Because concept albums – you know, a lot of bands have done them, um, but you don't know if people are going to get it or not. So what were you guys feeling as you were actually developing the material? Well, I can't speak for everyone, of course. Um, I only have my perspective, but uh, I was really into it. Um, I've been wanting to experiment with uh, the conceptual format for quite a while, actually since the beginning of the band. And if you look at our first two albums, you can see that we were experimenting a lot with themes. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I w- was trying to convince uh, Chris, my writing partner at the time, that that we should go f- for a full blown story. Um, we just didn't have a story at the time, and uh, so uh, when we finally had the story and it all started coming together, um, I think everybody in the band got on board and really contributed a lot of great uh, uh, playing and uh, a lot of uh, a good energy towards the record. You know. Mm-hmm. And um, it was really um, kind of no holds barred. It, we kind of went into it with the idea of no limits, that we were going to worry how to play it later, live, you know, that uh, we didn't want to put any restrictions on ourselves by saying, oh, I can't write this part because how would we ever do that? You know, we just, right. just went for it, really. And we uh, had Michael Kamen come in uh, and uh, work with us on some of the orchestration and some of the... Uh, classical themed uh, music that's uh, an accompaniment like on Sweet Sister yeah, Mary, for yeah. example. And uh, that was fantastic because that really, uh, his contributions really helped, I think, fill out uh, that song especially. For sure. But really, uh, I guess to answer your question, um, I, what I was feeling was excitement and just being engulfed in the story and, and trying to make it um, as realistic as possible. Uh, there's a lot of time and effort and focus spent on the segues between the songs and sound effects and how the songs flow together Mm -hmm. that uh, maybe if you weren't a musician, you wouldn't notice that, but you'd you'd feel it, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. uh, Like the size of the room that the nurse is walking through, we have figured that out, you know, what the dimensions were and how many steps it would take to get from the operating table where Nikki was to the door. Interesting. (laughs) I think those are the details people don't, wouldn't think about when they're hearing the songs. Yeah. So little things like that. So were you surprised by the reaction? Were you, I mean, you think about the weight of it, the impact that album has had. I mean, it's on every top 100 list out there. I I was researching. I mean, Rolling Stone, Krang, all these magazines that do top 100 heavy Mm -hmm. metal albums, that album is on all of them and in high position. So does that surprise you that so many people got it? Yeah, because they didn't at first. You know, it was uh, an album that uh, we put out, and I think I can speak for the band in, in, in saying that Everyone in the band was very pleased with it and very excited and proud of it. Uh, we put it out and nothing. It was just sort of like our other albums, you know, sold a small amount of records and we went on tour and supported it and it sold a little bit more and it finally came down to we'd spent mm, almost a year on the road supporting the album and our management said, time to make another record, boys. You know, wow. you've exhausted all the uh, touring opportunities we have for you right now. So you got any ideas for a new album? So we were toying around with new album ideas, and uh, we got a call from uh, Abby Conowitz in New York City, who ran MTV Music, and he said, I want you guys to make a video for this album. I love this album. I'm very into it. MTV is behind you. Do what you need to do. So we scraped up every bit of money we could get, and we made a a series of videos for the album, put the first one out, which was Eyes of a Stranger, Mm, in in conjunction with the single, Eyes of a Stranger. And in two weeks, we sold 500,000 albums. Crazy. Just boom. That's you know? crazy. Two more weeks, we went platinum. 
And uh, it really illustrated the power of television at the mm-hmm. time. And having, you know, we had a good album and we had some catchy songs, you know, that they could release as singles. And, um, and then we had MTV playing it every day, you know, so it was kind of a no brainer. Yeah. And then um, I Don't Believe in Love, I believe, is the one song that got nominated for a Grammy. And I don't yeah, yeah, I think it was Grammy nominated. Um, that album was so technically precise like the production and the sound on that album and you guys were digitally recording that album at sure. a time when it was very new so you guys have always kind of been on the forefront of, of it was trying actually one things. of the first uh, digital albums right. released yeah. right i and think one of five yeah and so with that in mind uh were there any things behind the scenes that went on in the production any challenges that people wouldn't realize yes. like, did you, were you <laughs> arguing over what should go on there and what shouldn't? Were, were, if you look back, was there anything you would have done different or you wish you had or hadn't done? Um, well, what you hear is not the original album. It was ma- remastered. Because we finished the album, one of the first albums made in digital, and we turned it into the record company, and they were like covering their ears. <laughs> oh, what is this? It was so hard and so... Uh, it is. It's so out front yeah yeah I mean, it's really it well you should have heard the first version <laughs> it was yeah, really really I, hard I to turn my knob to. all the way up when but I, that was exciting for us because that's what we were trying to make is this really hard album that was just brutal you know yeah cruel was the word that we coined listening to it but they uh they thought well at this time you gotta remember that the record company and audiences weren't li- used to hearing digital sound yet right you know, you We'd, we'd grown up with analog, so right. everything was softer and nicer and warm, you know, and now this was like, boom, you know, <laughs> a, really like a punch to the head. It was. Yeah. Th- that's what I was explaining. Like, when I first heard it, that is the feeling you got, but for me, in a good way, mm. in a good way. So they made us remaster it, and, and I'm glad they did, although I'd, I wish I had a copy of the first mastering, because I would have liked to... That would be interesting, yeah, yeah to kind of see... Yeah, it's a ABM, you know, yes, hear it now, 30 years later. Do you have a favorite track on the album? Uh, no, no. In fact, uh, playing the album in its entirety on this tour has really been a, a real treat for me um, because I don't normally play one of my albums all the way through, although I'd like to do that more. Um, this is really special and, and unique, and I'm really trying to savor every moment and every performance and and be grateful for it, you know, because uh, it doesn't happen all the time. And I don't know if I'm going to perform it again Um Maybe if I'm still able to, the 40-year anniversary, I don't know. Wow. <laughs> I hope so, maybe. I don't know. But uh, it's That's a- why everybody should get out to this show because it is going to be incredible. And I know a lot of people like me have been waiting to hear the whole thing mm. like you're doing. So it's a treat for the fans, for sure. Yeah, and it's a, I-, I can see that. It's a treat for me to perform it. And I love it, although it's very difficult to do it night after night. And, and not so much the I singing. I can imagine. Not so much the singing, but putting yourself in this kind of frame of mind mm-hmm. for the character. I'm not a guy that's uh, like Nikki at all. <laughs> yeah, know? that's interesting. I'm not like that. I'm a lot more gregarious and happier. Interesting. <laughs> you know? But he is really, really just uh, an intense character that is very angry at the world, and uh, it shows in everything he does, his movements, his right. gestures, and all that. And keeping that up for the amount of time every night performing it is – it's tough. It's like an actor. It's like an actor it, it having kinda, to do it's a role. It's very much like that. And, and my band, luckily, I told them when we started the tour, I go, I'll probably get kind of intense mm-hmm. and I won't be fun to be around. Right. But just remember that after the show, I'll, I'll, it'll all be good again. And yeah. I'll be normal. You kind of so let it all I'll go. let it go, you know. So uh, they tell me sometimes, okay, Nikki, you're getting kind of intense, man. <laughs> yeah. And it actually brings up an interesting point that you said that because um, – being that you have to do that, do you think people in some ways have misperceived you because of the intensity of a lot of your music? Yeah. Because I, I know me, having listened to your albums for years and sitting here and talking to you even before we started rolling, it, it is unexpected. You are, you're not – your personality <laughs> is different than I would have expected because uh, you do come across so intense in your music. Hmm. And some of the themes are so um, yeah, they're serious. adult themes. Yeah, it's very serious. And not in the sexual way, but right. you know, adult thinking themes. Yeah, serious. Deep stuff. thinking. Yeah, deep yeah. thinking. Critical thinking. Um, 
one of my favorite lines is from Revolution Calling, and it's it's about the media. You know, I used to trust the media to tell me the truth, tell us the truth. Mm-hmm. Now I see the payoffs everywhere I look. Who do you trust when everyone's a crook? That line to me sticks out because I remember at the time when this album came out, what was going on in the world at that time. Now you see what's going on in the world today. Does Does it strike you that those exact words are playing out so accurately, mm-hmm. almost like your album predicted things that were going to happen. It, what do you think about that? Do you ever, does that ever hit you? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of an armchair anthropologist, although I never went to school to study it. I'm fascinated by human um, endeavor, human development, uh, the human story. Really. Right. And I read books and, um, I think one of the things about mind crime, we touched about this earlier, that appeals to people and resonates with them is that it does mirror society. It mirrors life. You know, uh, we, it deals with classic themes of um, power and and no power, uh, love and, and hate, and manipulation, and um, and those themes are prevalent in uh, life, and they don't change. Mm-hmm. It keeps happening over and over and over again, although the names change, the players change, but what they do is very similar age after age after age for who knows how far back. Sure. It's just part of human development. You know, Maybe someday we'll get to this utopian future where we're all enlightened and we all uh, don't experience jealousy. Jealousy is this thing of the past that nobody even knows about anymore. Maybe when we won't have that. Maybe we'll develop past that, and I hope so. That would be great. Um, but until then, it just keeps happening. And jealousy is another word for hate, and people are jealous all the time. Mm-hmm. Je- and especially nowadays with social media, we're, we're just slammed in the face with all the things we're not, yeah. all the things we don't have, and it makes us mad and comparing angry. Comparing ourselves we're all the time. We're constantly comparing ourselves, and are we good enough? Are we smart enough? Are we pretty enough? Are we, you know, it goes on and on and mm-hmm. on, and mm-hmm. uh, it drives people crazy. It and does. It drives them to extremes, and... And that's what we uh, we see every day in the news now. Interesting. Um, let's talk about some other stuff uh, because it's some not, lighter things. Unless I'm, well, not some lighter things. Sorry. I was I was actually going to talk to you about American Soldier, and I'll tell you why. I have I have a personal attachment to our veterans, um, specifically Marines, and I've been doing veteran charity for the past thirteen years through my own things. And your father was a veteran, and you did your whole American Soldier tour. Your daughter was on that tour with you mm-hmm. and would come out and sing. And we were talking about how she would hold your hand cause she was nervous. I saw that tour that had some really heavy themes. And I'm just wondering what, what you, you did a lot of research on that album. I thought it was a very powerful album. You did a lot of research and you talked to a lot of veterans and you got their stories. What was the greatest thing you learned in that experience? Mm. Well, so many things really, um, you know, it started with my dad mm-hmm. and, um, talking to him about his experiences in Korea and Vietnam and uh, and not knowing the background of what he experienced until I was an adult because he never talked about it. Right. But then at some point he decided it was time and there I was with my phone, hit record and recorded the whole thing. And it really set me off on this course of trying to uh, interview as many soldiers as I could because I wanted to see if there was a, a continuity to it all. Mm-hmm. Was there a theme? Was there similar experiences that uh, these veterans experienced um, because that plays into my thesis of uh, our theory of uh, human evolution and how we keep replaying the same story over again. Anyway, um, I found that there were a number of stories that were fascinating, but um, so many of them are about people that are thrust into these amazing situations where they are tested at a a soul level, Mm -hmm. at a personality level. Uh, on who they are, because you you are you're tested and put in these situations where you have to do something, you have to react, and um, and the way people react, there's a commonality in there that's uh, very evident and very interesting, and you can take uh, a veteran from World War II, and you can talk to uh, another veteran who was from a more recent uh, situation, like say Afghanistan. And their stories are almost identical. Again, yeah. the names are different and the technology is different, but 
the actual basis of what they're experiencing is the same thing. Yeah. Over and over and over again. It's fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating study of hu the human mind. Um, okay, so we will talk about some lighter things. Wine. Please. Wine. Now you're, you're wine talking. Wine enthusiast. We should have been drinking wine in this interview. <laughs> How, you got into it when you were 14, yeah. I read. Um, what interests a 14-year-old in, in winemaking? Well, I didn't really have an interest in winemaking. I had an interest in getting a merit badge because I was a Boy Scout. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> and you could get a merit badge if you it. developed a, a food product or a beverage. Oh, interesting. And I just happened to be staying at my grandmother's house uh, for the summer, and uh, she was gone traveling. And I had to mow her lawn, and she had thousands of dandelions growing in her yard. And so I'm looking through her library trying to find a good book to read, and I see how to make wine from dandelions. That's the name of the book. <laughs> I picked it. I went, wow, Very random. I could make dandelion wine, and I could get a merit badge. <laughs> yes. Did you get the merit badge? I got the merit badge, yeah. Was the wine good, or was it hideous? Well, you know, I was a kid, and yeah. I, I made something, and I you know, gave it to my parents and their friends, and like all parents do, you know, oh, that's a really nice poo picture, <laughs> you know. So I don't know if it was really good or not, but it didn't make any of them throw up. So oh, well, that's, that's a good thing. That's always a good thing. But yeah. now you're making real wine. Yes, so tell real us wine. about Insania. Is Insania. It Insania. Okay. Yeah. And uh, tell us about that. What is it that you love about the whole process of winemaking? Well, when I grow up, I want, I want to be a farmer. I That's love what farming. My, my dad was the same way. Oh, he yeah. wanted. He wanted. He went. Was in the corporate world for many, many decades, and he retired onto a ranch. And he, he works the land. I love the land. I love working on the land. I love it, being in the vineyard. I love uh, developing the grapes and uh, watching them grow and testing out different varietals and seeing what does good in the in the climate. Um, I like all that. I like the crush, uh, the harvest. Um, I especially like the drinking of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the reward. Of yeah, the it, whole really, thing. it really is, especially when it's good and it it's uh, you know uh, memorable. Yeah, you know, uh, I like all aspects of it. And you know, if, if and when I can retire at some point, uh, that's what I'd like to do with my time is just spend it in the vineyard. I was going to ask you about that. And so you see yourself retiring at some point? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I there's a point where you, you got to kind of hang up your rock and roll shoes, you know, and yeah. You know, only come out on occasion, but yeah. Well, I hope it's not yet because well, you I've, still I've got, sound amazing. I've got 19 albums, and uh, I really want to do at least 20. You know, so yeah, I think good. I have one more album in me, maybe two. Good, you know? good. We're good. To, glad to hear that. Okay, I'll wrap this up because I know you have to get ready for your show. But one last question: I have to put my pants on. Well, you can put your <laughs> pants on. Is that what you think? Um, I'll ask you one lighter question. What is something about Jeff Tate that no one would expect? Like, what what makes you belly laugh? Just get silly and <laughs> really? not be intense. Yeah, really? yeah. Tell me the truth. I think it's funny when people fall down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know those videos you can watch on YouTube yes. where people run into things. And Jason, like, watch I, I am, I'm addicted to that stuff. <laughs> I love it. That's the image we're going to leave you guys with. Jeff, it's been so great talking to you. Thank you so much. This is, this is actually made a dream of mine come true. Oh, my pleasure. Thank so, you. And I cannot wait to see the show tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Brick. How? Stephen Piercy couldn't get.